Well, good morning, everyone. Let's see, we have one in the front row. Good morning, everyone. Great, thanks. Um, thanks for coming out for the, the I guess, Health Tech 2.0. We had our first uh, installment uh, back in May, and we had a great uh, attendance and participation, and it went so well, we decided to do it again. So here we are in November, and it's about twice as many people registered as uh, in, in the May conference that we hosted over at the Katz School of Business that uh, I'm affiliated with. Uh, my name is Jeff Inman, and I'm the Associate Dean for Research and Faculty at the CAT School. And uh, a couple years ago, I got involved with my co-chairs, and it's been a wonderful ride and a great experience, a learning experience for me. Um, in particular, Bruce, Bruce Rollman, I want to thank him, and Laura Burke, and uh, Michael Spring. Michael, you here somewhere? He was here somewhere. And uh, Sakina, Sakina Washington. So let's give Sakina a hand, because she did the heavy lifting on this. And I also want to thank uh, our sponsors, which are listed in the program, and in particular, uh, Mark Redfern and the provost's office, who provided the, the seed money that made this successful. And we were just talking uh, before, the, uh, uh, before we started this morning that we hopefully we'll get funding and be able to do this again next year. So uh, that'll be great if we can do that, because I think we've got good momentum, and I'd like to keep that going. So I just wanted to say uh, one or two things to, before I turn it over to, uh, to, to Mark. Um, so we're in the business school, and one of the key uh, goals of this initiative from the provost office was to bring schools together. And so this was a wonderful collaboration. We had uh, the med school, the business school, the uh, school of nursing, and uh, now that's the school of what? Uh, computing and information. Um, and it's been planted the seeds. And I'm hoping that uh, this conference will serve as a catalyst to spur additional collaborations across those schools and amongst the people in this room because uh, it can't just end here. So um, we're in the business school. We've got a world-class set of faculty who do uh, behavioral economics and use uh, social psychology to design interventions to help consumers make better choices. A lot of the same things we'll be talking about today. So as you continue with your research, and us too, let's uh, try to foster some more collaborations and move forward, and uh, hopefully maybe present those uh, results next year at the conference. If, so, and without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Laura Burke from the School of Nursing. No, not the School, Laura. Sorry, she's looking panicked. Mark, Red, Mark Redfern. She's like, no. Mark Redfern from the uh, provost's office. Thanks, Mark. Uh, <clears throat> well, good morning. It's my pleasure to welcome you here, both on my behalf, but also on behalf of the provost and the chancellor. I know when we did this last year, the chancellor came and spoke, and uh, it was really great to have him here. And he told me that he was very supportive of this, and uh, he wanted me to give everybody his best regards. Um, as we were talking before this, I, I have a few remarks, but I, I told Jeff, I said, Jeff, if you say the same thing I'm going to say, I'm just going to say, and what he said. And, uh, and what he said. That, so, uh, The only thing I wanted to, to mention is, uh, as I looked through the program, um, I was excited about the transdisciplinarity of the, of the program, that it's coming from a lot of different places with a lot of different kinds of people. Um, pretty exciting. You know, uh, my, my background, I'm a bioengineer. So bioengineers, by definition, we live on the interface. That's what we do. Uh, and that's where I see this conference, the, the potential for this conference. It's defining that interface and bringing people together who have different points of view and can think about things differently together. Um, and so I'm, I'm pretty excited about this, uh, this conference. I'm going to stay as long as I can uh, and interface with all of you. Uh, we had a great time last night for all of you who were here. Uh, talking about different kinds of projects that are out there. And I think, to me, those projects just reinforce this idea of bringing different kind of people together to come up with new solutions. I think bringing in the business school with nursing, medicine, uh, technology, um, venture capitalists, and that whole, that whole uh, side is going to be very, very exciting. So. Anyway, I just wanted to welcome you. I look forward to a day of talking with you and learning with you. Thank you. Oh, now it's Laura.
<laughs> Good morning. Thank you. And I'd like to add my welcome uh, to this. It's wonderful to have it. This has just been a really exciting uh, initiative that we've had, and it's been a real privilege working with Bruce and, and Michael and uh, Jeff. So uh, before I introduce um, our speaker, I do want to acknowledge the Dean Jackie Denbrot Jacob of the School of Nursing, who has provided funds to the uh, Hub for Excellence in eHealth Research, which is sponsoring two of the keynote speakers today. So it is a great honor for me to introduce our first keynote speaker today. I've known Dr. Bill Riley for over 15 years. His career has spanned industry, academia, and the National Institutes of Health. And we met uh, when he was in industry, provided me, I had the privilege of having excellent guidance from him from an industrial perspective when I was launching some electronic data collection many years ago, as well as when he was a program officer at the Heart and Lung Institute. So today, I would just like to point out some of the major points of his career, but most importantly, I think, is where he has progressed at the NIH and the significant role he's playing there in terms of our funding and the science of where we're going forward. So he has had many positions at the NIH, and certainly a testimony to the significant contribution he makes to our scientists, how he has been continually promoted in 2015, 10 years after he joined the NIH, he was appointed director of the Office of Behavioral Social Science and Research, which we all know as OBSSR. He's also the associate director of the NIH for social and behavioral sciences research. And more recently, he's also the um, deputy, I think it's assistant, the interim deputy director of the Precision Medicine Institute. So without further ado, uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. William Riley, and he is going to talk about how technology is transforming the behavioral social sciences into data-rich sciences. And I think Bill's going to speak until about 10 o'clock, and then we have like 15 minutes for Q&A. Thank you, Laura. Uh, and thank you, Jeff and Mark, and thank all of you for the opportunity to come here and speak to you today. Um, I love Pittsburgh. <laughs> um, it's great. I think I've been here a few times over the course of my career, so it's, it's always nice to come back. Um, a little more casual today, it's Veterans Day, um, which is a government holiday. Um, so here I am. Um, I will tell you that in my first, uh, first gig, my first year at the NIH coming from industry, um, I went into work on a day in November. Uh, I usually get in pretty early. We're usually not a lot of people around. I was working along, and somewhere around 9.30 or 10, I got up to see if I could find some coffee and realized there was hardly anybody around, um, and finally realized it was Veterans Day, and I just hadn't realized it because that's not an, it's kind of an unusual day for most people to take off, but here we are. Um, so I, I, this is sort of a movement in three pieces. Um, I'm going to speak a bit about sort of data poor to data rich sciences and the transformation that I think is happening in our sciences as a result of technology shift a little bit um, and focus on the precision medicine initiative since I've been sort of living and breathing that for the last couple of years um, in terms of where that can take us in terms of data rich sciences and its availability to us for uh, that kind of research uh, moving forward. And then as the director of OBSSR, I can't not talk about our yet to be but soon to be released strategic plan. So at the end of this, I'm going to spend a few minutes on uh, where we are in the strategic plan for OBSSR and some of the things we're going to try to focus on moving forward. So with that, um, I'm going to make the case that we have been living and evolving as sciences in a data poor research environment. Um, and by that, I mean that it's it, the way, if you think about the way we typically do research, right, we have a research question. We go about de designing a study and collecting their participants and collecting their data to answer that question. We then answer that question, and then in most cases, we toss the data, right? I mean, sometimes we'll hang on to it for a while, and most of us have um, in our um, computers just large amounts of old data sets that we swear sometime in our life we're going to get back to and do additional analyses on. We never do. We hardly ever have the time to do that. But that's the way we've typically done things, and we've done it that way because the, the data that we've had to collect is so resource intensive for us to collect, right? It just takes so much time and so much effort to collect it. So the priorities on perspective design and data collection with limited data collection opportunities, as a result, we see either mostly cross-sectional research or when we see longitudinal data, it's longitudinal data in a fairly minimal form, right? In clinical trials, it's a pre and intermediate and post and maybe a follow-up or two, 
Um, and we, we think we've done something really extravagant when we've gotten to about four or five sort of data points over the course of time. Um, as a result of this data poor environment, we can't control most of the confounds. Now, when I say confounds, remember that confounds for, in some of these studies are actually the very sort of predictive um, it, variables that we actually want to pay attention to, but we just wash them out. Um, and we, do, we wash them out mostly via randomization, right? So we take all of those confounds and we randomize them to error. That's our data poor environment. So what does a data rich research environment look like? Um, well, we've got some models, right? Meteorology is a data rich environment. Uh, plate tectonics and geology have at least data rich components to it. Uh, uh, the Haldron Super Collider um, and some of the some atomic physics work um, and then cosmology, all data rich sciences. And by that, I mean that all of them collect temporally dense data. They're, when they say longitudinal, they mean longitudinal in milliseconds and, and even smaller, right? Over courses of time, uh, but a granularity that in the behavioral and social sciences, we've seldom been able to achieve. Their perspective is more computational than statistical. It doesn't mean the statistical analyses aren't part of it, but they're really thinking about computational models. And those computational models are focused on prediction, right? not on linear causality necessarily, they're focused on prediction. Can I predict a future event based on the data I currently have available to me moving forward, right? Um, it's, if you talk to a meteorologist and you ask them, for instance, does that low pressure cell produce that jet stream change or does the jet stream produce that low pressure cell being where it is, they will look at you like you're crazy. And they will because they understand the sort of by modal linear causality, not linear, nonlinear causality that's going on here where these things are shaping each other over time. And most, if you think about most of our behavioral and social phenomena, it's exactly that same thing, right? Many years ago, Van, Van Dura didn't really know he was talking about um, nonlinear causality maybe, but he was talking about reciprocal determinism, right? But the, the process of behavior to environment, back to behavior, and those things shaping each other over the course of time. Um, that's the sort of model we're talking about. So how do these people get there? How do these sciences get to this point? So um, I've, I've been accused of having meteorology envy, um, and I'll, I'll accept that. That's probably true. Um, but they started the same way we started. They started with local limited measurement, right? Everybody had their own little weather vane and barometric pressure and temperature gauge in their own little spot, and they measured it over and over and over again. And they were able to predict to a, some degree of gross predictive ability what was gonna happen the next day or the next month or more importantly, the next year, which is where the Farmer's Almanac came from in a lot of these things. But they then leveraged communication technologies and in that time it was a telegraph. We have a little bit better communication capabilities now. But leveraged those capabilities to be able to link data together. They also said, we've gotta have standards for data. You can't have a different way of showing barometric pressure than I do. We have to be able to standardize these measurements across people and across locations and across time. So they did that as part of it. And then they continued to leverage those um, technical advances in measurement and communication as the technologies grew. The result is that there's this integrated computationally modeled data set that they can work from. Now it doesn't mean they can't still go out and do the data poor version of science that we have to do sometimes, where we have to go out, collect the data to answer a specific question, answer it and move on. But they have a data infrastructure in place that allows them to drop in and answer questions over the course of time without having to collect that data every single time they have a question. So the question for me is, is it possible to do that same thing with health research more generally and with behavioral and social science research more specifically? So my argument will be that we're at the dawn of being able to do that. Um, the, the, the three or four components that I think are really important. Uh, we've done ecological momentary assessment for many years, um, well over a decade at this point, though we did it mostly, Laura will remember far too well, on PDAs, um, which are not public displays of affection for those of you who don't remember. Um, but but that, was the, that was our technology at the time, and, and we did ecological momentary assessments or experience sampling prospectively over the course of time. That work has gotten much better. So for instance, uh, in the Healthy Heart Study, as you know, when we're doing research and we ask people, we need to know about their past hospitalizations or their hospitalizations over the last year in a large cohort study. Every year they come in, we say, how many times have you been hospitalized in the last year? Um, and they give us some rough guess that's probably wrong. Um, I mean, probably if they didn't get it at all, they're probably okay. Um, if they didn't go in at all. 
but, but it's, it's still sort of a rough guess. What Healthy Heart Study does is just event-based EMA. They've GIS located every clinic and every hospital within the greater San Francisco area. When that person gets to that hospital, they know they've been there. If they've been there for more than an hour, then at some point in the future, they ping them and say, I noticed that you're in so-and-so hospital. Are you there for yourself? Are you there visiting a person? Right? And they, they query them in essentially real time about why they're there and what they're doing. And then that way, they can prospectively collect the data. We have all this data from digital traces, digital footprints. Um, Sandy Pentland calls them digital breadcrumbs. Um, it's all the stuff that we sort of scatter you know, about ourselves as we go throughout our day and interact with technology. Some of the social media, and that's been one of the kind of early uh, foci of this work, has been around what people sort of put in when they're doing Facebook and Twitter and that sort of thing. And that's been a piece of it. But if you think more broadly about the Internet of Things and the stuff that we currently are able to collect, um, the example I always give people is you can pretty easily tell what my stress level is like from my DC commute if you could pull the computer data from my car, right? Because that data that's collected is telling you how often I brake, what my speeds are, um, all of those various sort of things along the way, and how long it took me to get from point A to point B. All that's in the computer, all of it can be pulled out. We even had some discussions with the Department of Transportation about how we can do that and how we can pull that data out, right? But that data is available to us, we just have to make use of it. But that's that interaction between the digital world and our behavior that allows us to do that much better than we've been able to do before. And then there's all the passively censored, passively censored data that all of you are well aware of um, in this space now. Um, and the ability both home-based and, and wearables to be able to collect data in real time that's not just physiological data, it's also behavioral data, contextual data, social data, the ability to know are you alone, are you with somebody, and if you're with someone are you just kind of in the environment and they're talking but they're not talking to you or are you actually interacting with them on a regular basis. We can sense that now. We can take that data and it's really from my early days of training where I was doing direct observational work. This is basically automated or virtual direct observation that we're now doing. Um, but also do it in a less intrusive way than it used to be when I used to sit there in my master's thesis and count the number of times one kid hit another kid in the school uh, yard. Um, so it's changed quite a bit from the way we used to do that work. And then the other part of that is then taking all of that data and analyzing it different. Laura and I were just talking before when um, we were having coffee about how the way we now collect data has changed the way we have to analyze it, right? We can't analyze the data the way we've analyzed it in the past. There are new methods in some of the big data analytics and some of the computational models that allow us to do that differently than we have before. Uh, so these are just some of the examples. This is, um, and I'm sorry, I have to, Every once in a while I have to like put these on because I've gotten to that age where I have to do that. Um, this is social This is social networking analysis done in the Framingham's Heart Study, both for obesity and for happiness, um, to give people some sense of how those things are connected. Uh, this is agent-based modeling efforts to look at what the role of tobacco taxes would be uh, moving forward and predicting those models of what kind of taxes and how much of those taxes over time would actually put a dent um, in tobacco use over the course of time. Um, and this is just one example. This is some of the work that I, I've been really fortunate to work with Daniel Rivera at Arizona State a little bit on sort of uh, system dynamic or control system modeling and taking that modeling and put it in into theoretical models of behavior. And how do we do that and what does that look like? Um, so you don't, you don't have to know all of the math here. Um, I, to be honest, I can't explain all the math. I have to dust off my differential calculus um, from college to be able to remember this. Um, but, but the, the gist of it is, is important, which is instead of statistical prediction, right, where we just sort of say, well, at about 0.3 or 0.4, this event is predictive of this event, we actually are able to say with much more precision, at least in terms of our prediction, that this, this, this movement of this many units in this particular variable should produce a, a change of this many units in this variable at some X point in time in the future. That's much more exact and much more precise than the way we've typically done statistical regression-based order predictions. Okay. Um, what that means, and I'm, I'm going to pull from Santos Kumar's work at, um, at MD2K, and I think maybe there's one more build on that slide, yes. Um, th so in the same way that we are able to predict in meteorology, sort of take all the data we currently have and sort of say, what, what is time point X going to be, and tell us in the head what that's going to look like. We can do the same thing with predictive maintenance. And so some of the work that Santosh is doing is actually um, automated assessing smoking behavior, doing that with 
arm movement and respiration movement to be able to model that, right? So he knows when people are smoking or not smoking. Looks then at all the contextual factors that lead to that person smoking or not smoking. And eventually the goal is, is that he can take all of that data and as that person has quit smoking and is now in maintenance mode, because their biggest problem is not that people can't quit, everybody can quit, it's like, I'm done. It's how long they can quit, right? How long before the maintenance occurs? And so with that data, he can now predict and ultimately hopefully preempt that lapse when it happens somewhere in the future, right? So it's, it's the ability to be able to do that and be much more adaptive and much more predictive and preemptive in the way we do interventions as well. Okay, um, I'm doing good. Um, so uh, movement number two, we're gonna talk about the Precision Medicine Initiative a bit. As an example of the sort of that data rich sort of environment, um, as well as the fact that, like I said, I've been living and breathing this for the last couple of years, so I, I can't not talk about it, I think. Um, so um, you remember this guy. Um, he won't be in office much longer, but you remember this guy. And a, a couple of years ago in his State of the Union address, um, he um, launched the Precision Medicine Initiative. Um, and, and the focus has typically been, can we use genetics as a uh, marker to be able to personalize treatment? Can some genetic variants tell us that somebody will respond to treatment A as opposed to treatment B? Um, it's much bigger than that and much broader than that. Um, and I wouldn't have worked on it as a behavioral scientist for two years if that was the only thing it was um, capable of doing. So um, at the same time, Francis and Harold Varmus, who was the um, NCI director at the time, um, did this article about precision medicine um, back when this first came out. And I'll, I'll just note the behavioral and environmental um, aspects of this because they also talked about molecular genomic, cellular, clinical, behavioral, physiological, and environmental parameters, all those parameters as they influence health over the course of time. And we'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute, but the behavioral and environmental measurement tools to be able to better characterize disease processes and treatment outcomes, assess not only disease states, but also physical, mental, and social functional status uh, to monitor behavioral and environmental exposures that contribute to um, health and to illness. Um, and potential behavioral and environmental predictors of treatment response that can do that. So this is what the cohort will look like, um, or at least this is what we hope it'll look like. Keep in mind, I, I, it's been interesting to be on panels where people talk about the Precision Medicine Initiative without reminding all of us that not a single person has been collected yet, um, right? So we've done pilot data collection, right? But the actual launch of the real thing has not happened yet. Um, but it's amazing because some people seem to have already uh, surmised what it is that's going to happen even though it hasn't even started at the beginning. Um, but soon, uh, we were hoping for actually before the president left office that it would launch. That may still happen, but we've got to make sure we do it right, not do it fast. Um, but over a million U.S. volunteers, um, keep in mind just in terms of scope, we, we've done a lot of work from Framingham. That was what, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 people somewhere in that ballpark. We're looking at a million people. And part of that is not just because we pulled a number out of the hat, um, but if you start thinking about the, what we're trying to do in a precision medicine initiative, which is here's a genetic variant that occurs in about 20% of the population, and here's an exposure that occurs in about 20% of the population. These are big percentages, right? It could be much smaller. And then here's a disease that occurs in about 20% of the population, 0 0.2 times 0.2 times 0.2. That's what we're dealing with under a million. Right? So it gets to be fairly small samples when you start looking at all those components of that moving forward. So a lot of the power analyses were built upon being able to look at certain percentages of genetic uh, variations across certain percentages of uh, environmental exposures into certain disease groups um, and the incidence of that over the course of time. Anyway, they're coming from two places. One of them will actually be from the University of Pittsburgh because Steve Reese's group has been uh, one of the uh, groups looking at uh, the health um, provider organizations and one of the health provider organizations that is working on this project. And the other place that's sort of interesting and because HPOs, we, we've done work with health provider organizations for many years in cohort studies, right? What's new and different is the president said, I want anybody to raise their hand and say, I want to be a precision medicine initiative participant. Um, well, there's no way to do that unless we just make it so that people can raise their hand and do that, right? So there'll be basically a website that anybody can go to, line up, set up, do what they need to do to get started, and, and we'll, we'll just come at it from direct volunteers. Now, the technical logistical issues with that for then subsequently finding a place where they can get their blood drawn and get a physical eval when they live somewhere in Wyoming is going to be really interesting, but we'll, we'll deal with that as we move along. Um, 
I've been really pleased with the fact that participants are going to be centrally involved in the design and implementation and have been already, um, but will be more so after we start getting participants in the study and we can actually bring what they have to bear to this process. So from the easy things like providing feedback on a regular basis, so instead of the typical thing that we do where we send out a newsletter every six months to our participants, this will be real time. They just gave us these data. We're going to give it back to them and give them what we know about it and what it means about them and how it relates to the rest of the people in their community or in their state or those kinds of things so they can see that in real time. And also allow them at some point when the data is far enough along and secure enough in terms of how to do this that there'll be a tier of that that any participant can go to and do their own analyses. Now that'll be on very aggregated data and, and things where we're really sure that they're anonymized, et cetera. But allow people to even be citizen scientists in this process and to be able to look at the data and, and look at it in certain groups like that. Um, so hopefully we're at the end of this, we're able to have a, a process where we've got very engaged participants that are working on this throughout with open, responsible data sharing and with the appropriate privacy protections for them, um, which will be interesting to pull off. <laughs> but anyway, the major components, so the Data and Research Support Center is at Vanderbilt, um, but also highly supported by Verily, um, formerly known as Google Life Sciences, um, to, to do a lot of the work for the data coordination. There will be, and I'll say this because in part of why I, I try to talk about this as many times as I can, the critical reason for building a data infrastructure is so researchers will use it, right? One of the experiences of the UK Biobank has been that they built a really nice um, system that not many people use, not many people go to and pull the data. So what's going to be critical is that we build a research enclave that's useful for researchers, but it's also going to be really important that researchers actually gather the data that they need and go into that research enclave to pull it. Also to be able to add additional data points to that data set um, and augment it over time. Also to select sub subcategories of this and particularly for this group, one of the things that's been talked about a lot in PMI is the ability to use it as a test bed for mobile and wireless and other types of technologies or any technology, right, as it's coming along. That we'd, you'd be able to sort of go, give me all the people with Android phones, da 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 da, that have this sort of thing and that have this particular disorder. I need 200 to do um, a, just an initial sort of run of this app that I have um, to do that kind of work. That's the sort of thing that we hope to be able to do with this. Um, a biobank, um, which um, is at uh, Mayo Rochester Participant Technology Center. This is the one that I think this group is particularly interested in. Um, and one that I spent a lot of time sort of making sure was in the Precision Medicine Initiative, that we had to have a, a center that focused specifically on the use of technology and doing this differently than we've done before. So web-based, mobile-based, um, sensor-based, all of those sorts of things, and be able to collect data in those ways more than we have before. And then, like I said, the health provider organizations. Pitt is one of the regional medical centers. There are now seven of those um, that are in the cohort, in the center or in the network. Um, there are also community health centers, federally qualified health centers that are also part of this, mostly because we have a lot of concern about making sure we have low levels, I mean, we have the diversity at the low levels of socioeconomic status and, and those sorts of things as well, um, as well as the VA uh, being part of that also. Um, so in terms of the type of data, um, and I'll skip this because I'm going to show it to you, I've got time to do that, I'm going to show it to you in, in a little bit more detail. Um, this is not your mom and dad's cohort. And, and by that I mean, one of the things that I've had the experience of, and it's, it's understandable because it's what everybody thinks what's supposed to happen, is everybody has come in hard to the hoop with their particular variable or their particular um, thing, right, that they want in the cohort. I mean, really hard to the hoop. Um, like, are, do you have this and are you measuring that and are you measuring this and, this, you know, and if you're gonna measure that, then you should use my measure because it's the best measure known to man. All of that's happening, right? And it usually happens in these large cohort studies before they get off the ground. This is a much more iterative approach. We're gonna have a version one launch. It's gonna have some very basic stuff in it, right? But then there's gonna be a version two launch and there's gonna be a version three launch. And because we're not bringing people into a clinic, but instead reaching out to them with technology to be able to do that, we can go, okay, well, we've now done these last eight survey modules, but we don't have anything on pain. Uh, we, we actually will have something on pain, but just using it as an example. So here's, some, here's a pain module. We'll just push that out in version two, um, and people will collect that, and we'll collect that over time, right? So these things will come along and be added as, as the effort goes forward. Um, 
and, and also a tiered approach in the sense that not all participants will have all data collected because in some places we won't be able to get their electronic health record because they don't have one or they don't have one we can access easily, et cetera. Okay. Um, so just in, in terms of the things that people are thinking about, um, and these were implementation white papers that the NIH, so don't hold the PMI cohort program to this. These were our recommendations from the NIH to them as they started this process to give them a jump start. Um, they're in the middle of developing and getting the approval, IRB approval for their protocol as we speak. Um, so again, these are just what we recommended to them. It might not be what they end up doing, but I wanted to give you a sense of some of the things. The physical eval, relatively straightforward and, sh and quick and short because we don't want to spend a lot of time on that, uh, especially in the early stages. So the things that you would expect, blood pressure, BMI, et cetera. Um, the biobank, um, people worry that we're collecting an awful lot of blood. Um, I think we're okay. I don't think anybody's going to faint. Um, but we are going to collect uh, uh, enough samples of blood and urine initially so that we can actually do a fair amount of work with that in the future um, without having to worry about being down to the last aliquot that we have for various things. Um, participant provided information um, from socio demographics, medications, healthcare access, physical activity, sleep, et cetera. Again, if your favorite um, variable is not on here, it all you have to do is say, well, here's a variable that might be important, and, and we'll try to get it in the version two. Um, electronic health records. This has been really interesting, and some of you I know work in this space. Um, the thing that's particularly challenging for this is not getting electronic health records from the health provider organizations. They all have that, and they're used to doing that, and Pitt's done this many times, so it's certainly able to do this again, to, to actually transfer the health, electronic health record structured data and unstructured data um, to the Precision Medicine Initiative's uh, Data Resource Center. The tricky part is what we'd like for direct volunteers to be able to do is say, here's my provider, this is who has my electronic health record, I'm pushing this button just like the old, the blue button model in the VA, I'm gonna donate my electronic health record to the PMI. It goes to that electronic health record, it extracts that data, it authorizes it, confirms it, and then sends that data directly to PMI. So we've got a group at Harvard doing pilot testing on um, ap APIs on this to be able to actually be able to do that um, in a relatively quick way. I will tell you we're not there, but that's the goal, that we get to that point somewhere in the future. And then physical and social environmental um, components, right? So not only the current address, but past addresses as well, and if we have to pull sort of uh, other types of data to be able to get that, we will, as well as GI and be able to link to GIS databases. Um, as well as in a subset of people who allow us to do this, be able to track location prospectively from their smartphone. So we can get better data about the exposures that they have than we would typically just from their work and home environment um, or uh, addresses. And then the wealth of sensor devices. Um, smartphone is going to be sort of the initial platform. We're going to try to pull as much data from the sensors that are available on a smartphone as we possibly can. Yes, I know where we at, about 67, 68% um, of the population in the U.S. now has a smartphone, so I know we still have about a third that we have to get one to um, over the course of time. But um, we'll try to collect as much as we can from that, um, and then people will bring their own devices, so the people who have Fitbits and those kind of things, we'll try to pull that data in to the degree that we can. And then in certain subgroups, we'll actually add um, sensors to that work, right? So in, in smoking homes, we might ask them to put a secondhand smoke sensor in their home. Uh, diabetic patients, we may ask them to actually use a glucometer that we provide to them, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the, the, the game plan as we look forward. So, I'm okay. Uh, the concept's not entirely new, obviously. Um, this is, you know, if you've got glasses, you did precision medicine to do that, right? And if you, and hopefully if you've ever had a blood transfusion, they did precision medicine to do that as well and didn't give you AB um, when you were O. Um, so um, those are all things we've been doing for many, many years. Behavioral interventions also are not new to this concept, right? We've been doing tailored interventions and expert system interventions for many, many years. Oh. Some of you are, are, have been around long enough to remember Project Match. Um, NCI now has a Project Match that's a pharmacogenomic study. But Project Match back in the 1990s was we have two different approaches to alcohol abuse treatment. Um, and are there different types of people who respond differentially to those two different treatments? It turns out the answer was no. Um, so it was a pretty significant null finding in that particular situation. 
Um, but it was one of the first attempts in a large scale effort to be able to determine could we actually predict some types of people responding to treatments differentially um, compared to others. And the place where it's probably been done the most is in internet tailored interventions, where we've been able to sort of tailor, um, based mostly on stages of change models, um, the type of intervention that people should get based on some of their baseline characteristics. But we're, we're now moving beyond that. And I think it's important to remember that the, the for whom is the personalized part, right? It's sort of for whom should this particular treatment work? Um, but in what context and at what time, one of the things that's particularly interesting about behavioral treatments is that they're very influenced by context, they're very influenced by the time in which they're delivered, right? Um, there have been people in the field who have argued that it's not the intervention that's that important, it's the intervention being provided to a person at a time that they're optimally able to use it, right? And if we gave them the same intervention six or seven different times, eventually it might work. Right? So it's a timing issue for us that we have to think about as well. And that's where we start thinking about things like just-in-time adaptive interventions, the ability to be able to adapt interventions concurrently over the course of time um, as it moves forward. And then also, the other unique thing about behavioral interventions is that we usually don't have one active ingredient. We have multiple. Um, I worry sometimes we have too many. Sometimes it feels like we have 20 moving parts in a study, in an intervention. Um, and, and we do that for a pretty obvious reason. One, we want to maximize delta. Right? We want to make sure we get a big effect. Two, we're not sure which one of these treatments are going to work for which people, so we throw everything at them, including the kitchen sink, and hope that treatment A, C, and D works for this particular person, and then B, F, and G works for this particular person. So we have those kinds of issues that we need to deal with. But as a result, we don't really understand particularly well in what combination and in which sequence so those various treatment components be done. Um, and this is where some of the work of Linda Collins and others in sort of uh, multi-phase optimization sorts of uh, studies and in smart trials and that sort of thing allow us with those designs to be able to better understand what combinations and what sequences those things are happening in. Okay. Um, and then, of course, for precision behavioral medicine, we need to have really robust moderators that we're working on. Okay. Um, just to make sure that people understood that this was more than genes, drugs, and disease in the Precision Medicine Initiative. So um, a number of us at the NIH wrote this article uh, just about the behavioral and social sciences and some of its application to precision medicine. It's already a little dated. It's only a year old, but um, it kind of gives you at least some of the sense of the things that I'll talk about today in a little bit more detail. So again, this has been around for a while. So uh, my boss wrote this article in 2004, right, for a U.S. perspective study of genes and environment, right, um, 2004. Um, so why didn't we do it back in 2004? Um, well, first of all, uh, GWASs were running about 10 mil. They're somewhere in the thousands or two couple thousands at this point in time. Uh, the EHR adoption rate in 2004 was 13% among uh, non-federal acute care hospitals. Uh, we're now well over the, well into the 90s and the high 90s for most of that and in the high 80s or low 90s for most um, outpatient clinics at this point in time, right? So we were able to get data from electronic health records that a little more than a decade ago we were unable to do. Um, 2004 was about the time that some um, modern psychometric um, research was being done, PROMISE, um, consensus measures like Phoenix, some big measurement projects were going on where we were going to be able to improve the self-report work that we do moving forward, but those had just gotten off the ground. The really cool thing in, 19, in 2004 was when the, that was the first, that was the year that the Actigraph, um, the first sort of research grade uh, accelerometer um, was released on the market. So all of you doing accelerometry work, just remember a little over 10 years ago was the first time that we've had accelerometers for many years. That one on the far left, um, Caltrack. I, I used it in a study trying to see if I could determine psychomotor retardation in depressed patients. That was 19, oh gosh, 80 something. Um, so we've had accelerometers around, but, but it was so terrible that it failed. So that we will, if you look in the literature, you won't find a report on that because it just blew up um, and didn't work at all. Um, but it wasn't that long ago that we were just beginning to do research-grade accelerometry work. Um, and now look at what we're capable of uh, moving forward. Um, if you were really cool in 2004, this was your phone. Motorola Razor. Remember these things? Flip those things over, they're really slick, they're really thin. I thought, oh, wow, I'm really cool. Um, and you would throw those things up on your ear. Um, things have changed a little bit since then, but you also couldn't buy any apps in the App Store. 
um, because it was 2007 before the iPhone was released, 2009 before the Android was released, right? So it wasn't that long ago, if you think about it, that most of the things that we're going to try to leverage on the Precision Medicine Initiative did not exist. They were not available to us, but now they're available to us to be able to produce a data-rich infrastructure to be able to do this work. So why mobile technologies in this space, right? First, to better characterize phenotypes and outcomes. If you think about the way we've typically done this, we've done it through electronic health record data primarily. Um, that electronic health record data, we've done some really nice work on being able to uh, infer what the actual phenotype is from data records more than diagnosis, right, to be able to get a better sense of what the phenotype is in the, in the electronic health record. Um, but only so well and only based on what happens if they actually come into clinic, but not anything in real life over the course of time. Um, so to be able to do mobile technologies, to be able to get more data outside of the clinic about persons and their outcomes and their phenotypes. Plus, as you, as you know, most of you who have worked in EHRs, outcomes is not something that commonly is in an electronic health record, right? Um, I had back surgery a year and a half ago, a year ago, um, which worked, by the way. That doesn't always happen. Um, and my doc has probably in his EHR a whole bunch of stuff about the procedure and what it was and all my baseline data and those kind of things. He didn't have any data on outcome. Um, I mean, he... he called me a month later to see if I was still doing okay. I don't know if he put that in the chart or not, but that's the outcome data that we have in most electronic health records, right? So to be able to assess outcomes much more temporally dense than we typically do is an important component of, of mobile technologies. To better characterize our treatments, as you know, in a lot of treatments, only people, only about half of people actually take the meds that are prescribed to them, depending on the treatment. Um, and to be able to monitor that and know in real time whether people are able to do that is really interesting. Those of you who don't know, the picture on the, my right, I guess it's your right too, um, is um, uh, the Proteus system, which is pretty high tech just in the sense you probably wouldn't have to do this with every adherent study that you did. Um, but basically it's a coded RFID tag on the, on the pill. And so each time you swallow it and your digestive system sort of erodes that um, cover, um, it then prompts and, and says, okay, the person actually swallowed the pill. Up until now, we only knew whether they took the pill out of the bottle, um, but this actually allows us to know whether they actually ingested it. Um, so pretty cool. So it tests treatment predictors beyond genetics. So heart rate variability is just one example, but all the variability of data over time and to be able to use that as predictors of subsequent um, outcomes along the way. Um, and then of course, the one everybody thinks of to intentionally measure behavioral and environmental risk factors. Um, that are out there and be able to do that in a reasonable way um, and do that much more intensively than we've been able to do in the past. And I think the one that people often forget, we have to be able to fully engage participants in a cohort study like this. And to do that, we have to use the technology to do that as well, to give them data back about what they're doing, what's happening, how it's res they're responding to various things as they go forward. Okay. Um, if there's still a website on NIH.gov slash precision medicine. Um, all you have to do is go down to Steve's office and ask him how it's going, I guess, too, <laughs> um, along the way. But there's plenty of things that are happening. Um, and like I said, launch will probably occur sometime, if not at the end of this year, certainly early in 2017. Okay. Um, finally, um, OBSR strategic plan. Um, for the last year, um, like Laura said, I've, I've been in this job about a year. Uh, maybe a little over at this point, um, as director of OBSSR. Um, and so we, we started out by sort of saying, what is it that we need to do? Keeping in mind that our office is not a funding entity, it is a coordination entity. Our job is to coordinate the behavioral and social science activities that occur at the NIH across all 27 institutes and centers. Um, and we have some money to be able to help with that coordination effort, but we don't directly fund grants. Um, but we wanted to think strategically about what are some of the key things that our office is uniquely poised to do that would help behavioral and social science moving forward. So we had a couple of prior strategic plans um, in 97. Uh, this is the first one. This is from Norm Anderson's time as director of uh, OBSSR. Um, the one that I'll just point out to you that I've, I've really focused on and tried to carry forward, integrate biobehavioral perspectives in all NIH research areas. Um, in civil rights, being separate but equal did not work. And in biomedical research, being separate but equal does not work either. Um, and this meeting and the fact that you guys have um, groups in, in a transdisciplinary way thinking across all these various perspectives 
is the way that I think our office also should be doing things, that we should be integrating within the larger biomedical research efforts of the NIH, um, not going, well, let me, I want to carve out my little piece and make sure I do this. So I've kind of carried that forward um, from Norm's plan from, uh, what, nearly 20 years ago now. Um, and then the 2007 plan, and this was uh, during Dave Abrams' time um, as director, um, we still have a significant part, and you'll see it in terms of uh, methodology and measurement and some of the system science approaches that I think David was really instrumental in, in moving forward in that group. So a couple things that we really tried to focus on, and I'll just, the last one is the most important. You will not see in our strategic plan your favorite disease um, because that's not our job, right? You won't see you know, obesity and smoking and heart disease and cancer. You won't see any of that because there are institutes that do that. Our job is to provide an infrastructure base for behavioral and social science to be functional in all of those spaces. So um, what you'll see is sort of unique to that kind of component. Um, I won't take you through the pain and agony of the strategic planning process. Most of you have been through that yourself, know what that's like. Um, you'll recognize some of the people in our strategic planning work group because you probably work with them in one form or another um, among these various institutes there um, and the things that they've been doing. But it was a really good group who was very helpful over the course of the year in structuring this and moving it forward. We also had an expert panel that met in January. And again, I put them up there just because you may recognize some of the people. Um, Ellen Leshner was kind enough to come out of semi-retirement. I don't think he's really retired from AAAS, but he came out of semi-retirement to um, chair this um, meeting for us with the expert panel, which was nice to have. So it was a good group for that as well. Um, so this is where we actually came up with, um, and I'll go into these in a little bit more depth with each. Um, I'll talk a little more about uh, basic to applied research synergy and the, and the need we have to fix the broken pipeline that we have from basic to applied the methods, measures, and data infrastructures that we need that are related to what I talked about earlier about data-rich systems and being able to do that kind of science. And the application and adoption of uh, basic or of behavioral and social science research, um, which is interesting because there's two R's there, BSSR research. Anyway, I'll fix that on the next time around. Um, and then there's four foundational processes that are things our office has always done and will always do. Communication, program coordination and integration, training efforts, and I'll talk about that in a second, and then policy and evaluation efforts. So in the foundational processes, um, one of the things that we're gonna try to focus on in the office is communicating the accomplishments and recent research that all of you do and making sure that people are aware of it. Um, so my pitch to you related to this is, you have a recent study that you've done that you think is really cool and you wanna send me a preprint, do. Um, because it's the sort of thing, what we're doing now are these blogs called Research Edge where every month we go through research that's been published that was funded by the NIH and pick one or two of them and just to highlight them and make sure they get out for people to see the kind of research that's being done that the NIH is supporting. Um, our coordination efforts I won't bore you with because it's, it's, it's mostly the internal working kind of things that we have to do. We've supported a fair amount of training efforts, and I'll just remind you that there are 11 summer training institutes of various types that the NIH, the OBSSR, has funded right now um, that are currently ongoing. From the randomized control trial effort that uh, Peter Kaufman and his group does um, every year. Um, Linda Collins did one on optimization designs for us. There's been work on community-based participatory research some of the recent epidemiologic work, those types of things. So there's a number of them out there um, that are being done, and they're all on our website. Um, but one of the things that we're going to try to do is take our training emphasis has mostly been on summer training institutes with primarily junior faculty level people, um, though there's been postdocs in there as well, and move that down a little bit to spend a little bit more focus on K awards and Fs, maybe Ts as well, but in some of the other kind of training awards and mechanisms, which our um, office hasn't done that much of. And then all the evaluation work to make sure that we understand what's being funded and how it's being funded and how effective it is and what kind of impact it has on the field. So the three scientific priorities. I'm doing, man, my time is all right. It's amazing. I thought I had too many slides, but it's looking good. Um, scientific priority one. Um, if you look at applied research nowadays in the behavioral and social sciences, you'll find that from my perspective, I don't see anything that new. Um, we've got things, we have, you know, new variations on a theme, um, but in terms of the underlying principles that drive the, the um, intervention components, 
They're things from Pavlovian conditioning, skinnery and operant conditioning, modeling, um, self-efficacy. I mean, these are all things from 70s, 60s, 50s, work your way back, right? The, the pipeline, and, and those things came from a basic to apply pipeline that was very strong at that time. It's weakened, it's, it's, it's lost some of its power, I think, over the course of time. And so one of the things that we wanna to try to do in the office is strengthen the basic behavioral and social sciences that are funded by the NIH and also work harder to make sure that applied researchers know what that basic science research is that's applicable to developing new interventions and novel approaches. Um, now, if you ask me how we're gonna do that, I'm not entirely sure, but I know it's a goal and it's one that we'll continue to work on. And if you have ideas after the break, you can always come up and tell me how you think we could um, work on improving that um, part of it. But I, it, it's a big problem, I know, and it's a problem that we have to address. Um, the other is on methods, measures, and data infrastructures. Um, that data-rich model that we were talking about before is the model that we're gonna try to achieve here, that we wanna actually have more data integration. Um, Behavioral and social scientists in some ways have probably been more siloed than most researchers. Collect their data, hold on to it, and don't share it with other people. Um, we've got to build a model in which we share data, we share it readily, we share it all the time, we give it to people, we let them use it, we let them analyze whatever they need to analyze. We integrate it to the degree that we can. Now to integrate it, we have to have constructs where we mean the same thing, which we don't, right? People will say the same construct name and mean something different, or they'll say a different construct name and mean the same thing. What's well, the self-efficacy versus perceived behavioral control? Um, I'm sure that Aslan and <laughs> Bandura could probably argue about the nuances of the difference of that, but they're essentially the same. I mean, so we have to build basically an ontology or taxonomy that allows us to do that, allows us to actually integrate data better than we currently are able to. Um, the next is development and testing of new measurement approaches. Um, and by that, I don't mean yet another self-report measure of X, right? We, we have enough self-report measures of X. Um, and, there's, and I think it is important for all of us to think about, is, do we really need a new construct? Or is the current construct good enough? And do we really need a new measure of it? Or are the current measures good enough? And if they're not good enough, then we make the move. And then we go, okay, here's a new way to measure it, much more granular, much more appropriate, much stronger than the way we've been able to do it before, but not yet another thing so that I can say, well, here's the Raleigh measure of attitudes or something like that, right? Um, and be able to build that. Now, the technology piece of that's gonna be a very important component of that because technology really is driving a lot of that new uh, measurement work, which has been nice to see. And then the repertoire of measures in the social and behavioral sciences which allow us to be able to do the sort of work that we need to do to analyze this new temporally dense data that we're getting um, and doing that work. Um, and then finally, um, when I went around to the IC directors to ask them what could OBSSR do and what kind of things do they see as the needs in behavioral and social sciences that need to be addressed, the one that came up more often than not was we fund a fair number of interventions. Now, you could argue with whether they actually fund a fair number of behavioral intervention studies, but their problem is they see that and then they go, and then it, nothing happens to them. They sit on a shelf, maybe a few people use it, but we don't see adoption. We don't see it pick up. Now, part of the problem for the behavioral and social sciences is we don't have the infrastructure for adoption that some of the biomedical research right, has. We don't have an FDA for the regulatory control. We don't have a profit-driven system that pushes out new pharmaceutical and medical devices as they become available. So we don't have a lot of that. We mostly have public, you know, healthcare facilities rubbing dimes together trying to figure out how they're going to do something new and different. Um, the, the probably exception to that has been what the diabetes prevention program was able to do in being able to streamline, package, focus, and get it to the point where it's now available in every YMCA and it's now also reimbursable in insurance. But that's an unusual case, right? In most cases, it's very difficult for us to get these things out. And so we have to find some ways to facilitate adoption. And intervention researchers need to be thinking ahead at the beginning about how are people gonna adopt it and how are they gonna use it? And will I evaluate it in the context in which it's likely to be used and not in some artificial context in doing that work? So that's our thinking with all of that. And with that, I think I'm done, so I will stop and the opportunity to ask questions. Thank you.
Thanks, Bruce. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Good questions. So this is open for questions. Um, Ellen. Thanks for a great talk, Bill. Thanks, Could Ellen. you say a few words about the informatics infrastructure that's going to be needed to make all of these data actionable for end users, including the people who generate the data to drive our own insights around our own behavior. But I'm also thinking about infrastructure in clinical settings, in care management settings. You know, we have all of these data. We now have more ways than ever to collect them. There's so much potential. Right. But unless we have dashboards or other sorts of informatics infrastructure, how can we really optimize use of them? And, and is that something that and, and who will do that research? Is it part of what you see as important in the sort of precision behavioral medicine initiative? Yeah, that's a great question, Ellen. I, I think that's exactly right. I mean, we, we have all this data. We don't know very well how to analyze it, though we borrow from our friends in computer science and engineering who have done more work in that than others have, and how to analyze that kind of temporally dense granular data. Um, how to display it to patients, participants, so they understand it is a whole different issue altogether, right, in terms of making sense of it. Um, if you give somebody their heart rate over the course of a day, I mean, what, what do they do with that, right? How do they interpret that? What, how do they make sense of all of these bumps and jumps and that kind of thing that go on throughout the day? Um, we, like you said, I don't think we have a lot of good, we have some, but we don't have a lot of good research in how to provide that data to patients. Now, health literacy, numeracy kind of work is sort of where we should begin to think about that. Um, but we need to do that a little bit better. Um, when I was at NHLBI and the, the work was just coming out on being able to do near continuous blood pressure monitoring, and I gave it to my cardiologist colleagues and said, isn't this cool? And they said, well, this doesn't follow the JNC guidelines. I mean, what am I supposed to do with this, right? I mean, I'm supposed to do something for blood pressure based on the blood pressure that person gives me when they come in the clinic. Um, what am I supposed to do with blood pressures that go all over the map over the course of 24 hours? I, I don't have, what's the actionable step, right? Um, and I think that's one of the places that we need to pay more attention, especially with providers, is in how we make data understandable and actionable. Um, we, um, the IOM did a report that uh, OBSSR and NCI helped fund a couple years ago on uh, capturing uh, bi uh, behavioral and psychosocial determinants in the electronic health record. And their, their recommendations, I think, were very good, and they were pretty minimal, right? De you know, depression, smoking, physical activity, some basic sort of thing, neighborhood characteristics, uh, kind, of, kind of thing. But then the question is, if you put that into an EHR and then you display it to a provider, what are they supposed to do with that information? And unless they have some actionable, you know, this is what you should do under these conditions, um, that's, I think, the next step we need to take with that data as well. As you're walking, Ellen, do I get to plug the book while I'm at it? So, the um, Ellen, along with um, uh, why am I blind? Um, with Brad Hesse and David Ahern, uh, just had a book published on um, oncology informatics. Some my my some of my thinking actually about data poor to data rich environments is actually in that book. But it's a really nice book. So, anyway, that's my plug. Thank you. Hi, I'm Anna Radovic. I'm in the uh, Department of Pediatrics at the School of Medicine. And thank you for this wonderful talk. It was really insightful. Thank you. Um, one thing I'm wondering about the whole precision medicine movement and in terms of collecting data from direct volunteers, how and if children would be involved in that data collection because, for example, working with adolescents, some of them who have high blood pressure or obesity, we have to pull data from adult samples like the Framingham Heart Study and it's really difficult and then thinking about predicting, um, using their genetics and their environment to predict what will happen when they're adults is really important. Right, right. No, that's a, a great point. Yeah, and we're, we've been working the poor ad health data set to death, haven't we? Um, so I, I guess a few things. Right now, PMI is starting with adults just so they can get off the ground. We'll work their way back and they'll probably do that in stages and one of those first stages will be and one of the pro-band participants will ask them, are there other people in your family, including your children, willing to do this? And then we'll, so we'll have to build some child sort of versions of that and then start building that out. So that'll happen over time, but it won't happen initially. Um, the two other projects that are worth mentioning, um, they just launched this last week, um, they had their launch meeting, the um, Environmental Child Health Outcomes um, Project, so ECHO, which is sort of the reincarnation of the National Children's Study, but hopefully 
will turn out better than the National Children's Study did. Um, but part of why they'll, I think one of the things they'll be helpful with it is they're pulling from existing cohorts and integrating them and merging them together. So it's like over 30 cohorts of infant and early childhood cohorts that they're merging together into a, a large data set that can be used. And then new data that would be laid on top of that um, across all of those. So there's an opportunity there as well as that builds out. And then the other thing I'll mention is the Adolescent Behavior and Child Development Project that NIDA leads. Um, and that's been, um, I don't think it started yet, but coming along pretty far at this point. So there's three large projects from infancy to adolescence to adulthood that I think will help build that data infrastructure across the board. Um, one of the pieces you touched on, but um, I think it's important in the next, in the coming years, is the siloed effect of uh, data sets not being easily accessible. Um, oftentimes it's be behind a paywall because to recuperate the kind of uh, research costs associated with it, right. how do we kind of mitigate that accessibility versus the, uh, while still helping them pay for the study itself? Yeah, no, it's, it's a great point. Um, we're, we're really good at unfunded mandates at the NIH, aren't we? Uh, <laughs> Here, do all of these extra additional things. And, and all, all the deans and provosts are going, yeah, yeah, you're damn right. Uh, <laughs> yes. um, so, and, and so, and that's been one of them, right? We said, you need to data share, but we're not gonna help you pay for any resources to share data, as if somehow magically that just kind of continues on in perpetuity without you having to do any maintenance or anything like that. And just the, the, the ability to get to the point where you have a data dictionary with the meta tags and the sort of things that you need to do to do that. Now, part of that, I will say, is that we should be thinking about data sharing from the initiation of the project, right? And so we should be building those data dictionaries and data infrastructures with the mind to other people using them that don't know anything about the study, right? So we don't have to go back and fix it so that it's actually usable for others other than their own needs. Um, so that's a first step, I think, in that process. But I think one of the things that we're gonna have to do as the NIH is come up with ways to support the, that sharing part of this, like how data gets shared and how, how, what kind of credit people get for actually having the data even though they're not doing the analyses or the write-up. Um, Phil Bourne's group in the Big Data to Knowledge Initiative at NIH has been working on that. I don't know that we've got a firm solution yet, but it's certainly our goal that you guys have more resources to do data sharing than you currently do. Thank you. Mark. Somebody else wants to raise their hand. Uh, thanks. I have two questions, and they're, they're different, so you can pick whichever one you want to answer. Oh, good. <laughs> um, the first one is, how does this, uh, are, are you interacting with the folks across NIH, like the NIH Toolbox Project, and how to bring those kind of data into the kind of data that come out of the behavioral mm -hmm. uh, sciences? And how are you thinking about doing that? That's question number one. Question number two is how are you interacting with the CDC and all their efforts in this sort of space? So you can pick whichever one you want to talk about. Oh, good. All right. Uh, I'll, I'll, I can pick the first one because that one's a little easier for me. Um, <laughs> the, um, it's certainly been the case that um, both for NIH Toolbox, Promise, some of those other initiatives, um, we've been sort of part of that effort moving forward in behavioral and social sciences. Um, I still think adoption has been slow. Um, I mean, those, those tools are there. And one of the things that I think people misunderstand about those tools is that they're not meant to be the measure you use instead of everything else. They're meant to be a reference metric on which you can lay any of your other tools, right? Um, so uh, Sung Choi at, with Dave um, Sellers group, for instance, did a really nice study. If you haven't seen these co-calibration efforts, this, this is one you ought to look at, because he did it to kind of say, this is how we all ought to do it. He took the Promise Depression Scale, he co-calibrated it against all the sort of commonly used self-report measures of depression, and basically set it up so that for any score on any one of those other um, scales, you can actually produce a Promise Depression score metric. Um, so that everything, I mean, think about how we do this, right? I mean, there is no, there is no, um, oh, my back again. there is no mercury in our current blood pressure cuffs, right? We still express it in millimeters of mercury, and we do that so we have a consistent metric on which to express the thing we're important, the phenomena. Um, no one said, oh, we'll do it in, 
I don't know, Newton's cubed or something for these, these right. things. They, they stuck with the metric. We didn't do that in the behavioral and social sciences for the most part. So now we have to work backwards at doing that. And I think both the toolbox effort and promise and some of those others are ways to sort of do that. And we need to really sort of encourage that a little bit more. I, I will sort of answer the CDC piece. Um, there's certainly been efforts that we've done. I don't think we've done it as strongly as we could. Um, so there's some small places where we're working with them on some of their survey related efforts and some of that kind of thing, um, but not as much as we probably could. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yep, yeah, one here and then there. Yeah, um, for the million volunteers that you'll be um, recruiting, have, do you have any experience with whether, whether people are going to be willing to provide the kinds of information, the access to their personal information that you're, you're hoping to get? And is there any concern that you um, need a diversity in terms of the million people who volunteer? And, uh, yeah. Um, in terms of response, um, at least our pilot data has shown that people are usually pretty good at being responsive and answering questions and actually answer them um, more often and some would even say more truthfully via computer than they do face to face. Um, so I think we're doing fairly well on that side of things. Um, though, I mean, we'll have to see as we move forward if there's some, you know, missing data and where that missing data is coming from and, and make sure we, we stay on top of that. Um, the second, what was the, oh, the second one was diversity. Um, so we've been really concerned about the diversity issue for a few reasons. So one, this is not a, the PMI is not a representative sample, right? Um, we, didn't, we didn't sort of select people and then, you know, go to them, right? It's impossible to do that anyway, but you've got, people can just raise their hand. We will probably, and I just say probably because I don't, I, I can't commit to it though, I, it's sort of the game plan, is that at some point along the way, we will select a small representative sample within the PMI, have them function essentially like direct volunteers, and then weight all the rest of the data to that so that we're able to do that. Um, and actually, we pull a lot of the sociodemographic data um, and the questions from places like NHANES and NHIS and those kinds of places so we can even do that kind of um, waiting um, if necessary early on. Um, we work really hard with communities on sort of diversity. Uh, we've worked um, really hard with these community um, health centers which are not typically very strong research centers at trying to sort of maximize that diversity. But one of the things that PMI is going to need to do moving forward is stay on top of that data dashboard on a daily basis almost and sort of go we're not collecting enough you know uh, lower white, middle, or whatever, you know, whatever that group happens to be, and pull them in and try to find other ways to reach out to them as we move forward. Um, it's going to be tricky, but the, the goal is to even go beyond the typical sort of thing, right? Uh, severe mental illness, um, you know, so can, can we actually include people in hospital settings? Can we include people in, that are incarcerated? Uh, all of those sorts of groups and make sure that we have enough outreach that we've covered pretty much the lay of the land. That might not happen initially, that may take a little time. Um, the question, uh, thank you for a wonderful presentation and a great initiative. Thank Very you. exciting to see what's developing. The question that I had actually parallels the two questions that came before. We have been in the provider sector so beleaguered with HIPAA hmm. as a dilemma about information sharing. And if you have a website where people voluntarily present themselves in terms of being identified with an IP address, how do you talk to them about maintaining the integrity of their privacy while simultaneously inviting them to be a part of a large pool which is data mined and ultimately could go in both directions? Well, yeah. No, it's a good <laughs> thank you for the tough question. No, that's exactly right. Um, th this has been really one of the more tricky things for us. Um, the Office of Civil Rights has been helpful. They've worked with us some about sort of exactly what are these HIPAA guidelines and where do they come from. And, you know, at what point, you know, what are the issues that we need to address? Um, and have actually even offered a couple of sort of clarifications of the guidance in terms of HIPAA about data sharing and data sharing for research purposes and that sort of thing. So that it makes it a little easier for people to understand that, yes, you can share your electronic health record data with a research entity. Um, the question then becomes, once it's at the research entity, what, is, what are their responsibilities for that and what do they have to do? Um, and the other part is that if we're going to give data back to participants, right, and that includes data from their electronic health record, what do they do when they see something that's wrong, right? I'm not really, I'm not taking that med anymore, so what do we do with that? 
I wish I could tell you I have all the answers for how we'll fix that. We know what the problems are, and we know that we'll probably have to give patients, for instance, the ability to annotate, which doesn't mean that they'll change their electronic health record, but be able to sort of just note for us in the PMI that that's the case. And we'll have to figure out if there's some way to kind of loop that back into the electro, actual electronic health record. Um, but, and then the other is that when we get to the data enclave side, we're gonna have to be very careful about what's anonymized and what tiers of availability researchers have to be able to get to data for that as well. I think we've run out of time. So I, I wanna thank you very much for an excellent presentation. Thank you, Laura, thanks. You, for, are you gonna be around all day? I'll be around all day. All day so you can grab my coffee break or um, in between session to session. Thanks again. Thanks again. Thank